welcome to another show of this week. This week we decided to do things a little different. Our lead story will remain unscripted as we highlight sights and sounds from the ongoing arrival of the SPLM SPLA in opposition to Juba. Their arrival, according to observers, is a step closer to the formation of the transitional government of national unity. By the end of this week, I hope that the, the required number that is supposed to report to Yuba will be here, and thereafter, we will expect the arrival of Dr. Riyagmachar. <laughs> This marks the beginning of the real implementation of the agreement. I, from this place, I assure the people of South Sudan that within the next two weeks, the Tigono will be established. Viva! 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 Peace now is uh, being implemented, and uh, I agree with the minister that uh, it's very soon we shall form the government of national unity. And the first vice president will be here. Uh, we shall be here, all of us receiving him. Viva! Viva freedom fighters! Viva! Viva SPLA! Viva! Viva peace! Viva! And uh, we can assure that the internal community is committed to work closely with the two parties until the end, and then to transport the number required and also to prepare the ground for the arrival of the first vice president to form the Tigunu. In our next story, the United Nations Mission in South Sudan spokesperson Ariane Quinter said the UN mission will continue to extend its logistical support in the transportation of the SPLM SPLA in opposition troops to Juba. Speaking to reporters at a weekly press briefing in Juba, the spokesperson said that the first airlift took place last Thursday on March 24th, where the mission used its air assets to transport the opposition from Pagak via Malakal to Juba. Commencing on Thursday, March 24th, and MIS extended its logistical support to the transportation of SPLM AIO troops from Malakal to Juba as part of its mandate in support of the peace agreement and its implementation through assistance to the Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission, the JMAC. The current plan is for ANMIS and other members of the international community to continue to support this movement throughout the week. Followed by a subsequent early Monday, 28 March, two days ago, of 39 SPLM slash army um, in a position soldiers from Malakal to Juba, including the light personal weapons. The mission is planning on flying an average of 40 passengers each day through to April 1st as part of its contribution to the incoming movement of SPLM AIO to Juba, consistent with the agreed transitional security arrangements. And this will continue within its existing capacity to provide aircraft for the operation while maintaining its regular aviation commitments and provision of supports to its locations across the country. In addition to provision of transportation of SPLMA in opposition, ANMIS has also supported JMEC with the clearing of the land in some designated cantonment sites, including flattening the terrain and clearing an exploded ordinance by the United Nations Mine Action Service UNMAS team.
Our next story takes us to the United Nations headquarters in New York, where senior United Nations officials on Thursday, March 31st, cautioned that the humanitarian and human rights situation in South Sudan remains dire. In speaking at the Security Council, they asked the Security Council to call on the parties to the conflict and armed actors to uphold their obligations under international law to protect civilians and aid workers and grant free access for delivery of life-saving supplies. The chairman of the Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission in South Sudan, Festus Mogai, told the Security Council that implementation of most aspects of the agreement continues to be delayed. Implementation of the most aspects of the agreement continues to be delayed. The key milestone for the initial element of the agreement, the formation of the transitional government of national unity, has yet to be reached. Violations of the permanent ceasefire also continue, as most recently documented by the ceasefire and transitional security arrangement monitoring mechanism in the states of Upper Nile, Western Equatoria, and Western Bar El Ghazal. The head of the United Nations mission in South Sudan, Ellen Margaret Loy, said that South Sudan is at a critical juncture and there is a need for both leaders to form the transitional government without any delay, as this is essential for the country's longer-term stability. She highlighted that despite tension between communities when recent violence occurred in a UN protection site in Malakal in February, Humanitarian partners were working on restoring service delivery. Since that incident, UNMIS has been supporting humanitarian partners to re-establish facilities and restore service delivery within the site, while also providing force protection for food distribution, both within the site and to the IDPs who relocated to Malakal town. Is speaking at the Security Council, the UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordination, Stephen O'Brien, said humanitarian convoys are consistently being subjected to demands for payment at checkpoints. The challenge in South Sudan is an increasing disconnect between the assurances of national and the actions of local groups. All too often, even when official assurances are received at the national level, they are not respected by local actors. Illegal exactions and taxes remain rampant, and humanitarian convoys are consistently subjected to demands for payment at checkpoints. Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights Kate Gilmore in her statement said a legacy of violence and revenge reflected an urgent need for accountability for human rights violations and abuses. A legacy of violence and revenge underscores South Sudan's urgent need for accountability for both past and present day human rights violations and abuses, as well as violations of international humanitarian law. Yet in spite of the repeated public and formal commitments given by the parties to the conflict to end the violence and punish perpetrators, no evidence has been found of any genuine effort by either the government or the opposition to live up to these undertakings. For his part, South Sudan's ambassador, Joseph Mumajak Ngor Malok, denied that government soldiers were committing human rights violations, but acknowledged the SPLA, the SPLAIO, and other criminals use the same uniform. It is acknowledged that the SPLA, the SPLAIO, and other criminals use the same uniform, unless the culprits are physically apprehended. It is impossible to determine whether it is the government soldiers and its allied militia, the SPLA-IO, or other armed criminals committed the crime. Despite the obstacle highlighted at the Security Council, the UN and partners were able to reach more than 1.5 million people without assistance, often the most remote areas.
Following up this week, we have a humanitarian update in which the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR, raised concern about an increasing number of South Sudanese who are fleeing into Sudan. The following story highlights reasons why. Briefing reporters in Geneva on March 29th, UNHCR spokesperson Adrian Edwards said that so far almost 200,000 South Sudanese refugees have crossed into Sudan since the beginning of the conflict. UNHCR is concerned by the increasing number of South Sudanese fleeing into Sudan because of increased food insecurity caused by the ongoing conflict and deterring, deteriorating economic conditions. He said that those fleeing deteriorating security and humanitarian conditions need to be granted protection. Although they are not granted refugee status, they are essentially entitled to the same legal rights as Sudanese citizens. Uh, we are urging that this protection continue to be granted to people uh, fleeing the deteriorating security and humanitarian conditions. According to UNHCR, heightened food insecurity and growing unrest in parts of South Sudan, especially in northwestern states of northern Baragazal and Warab, have led to around 38,000 people fleeing into East and South Darfur since the end of January this year. People have had trouble accessing food along their route. They need basic uh, uh, relief, basic <coughs> help. Sudan, as you know, is home to about <coughs> 300,000 South Sudanese who remained in Sudan after the secession. So far, almost 200,000 South Sudanese refugees have crossed into Sudan since the beginning of the conflict. UNHCR fears the situation could quickly worsen as access to food in Upper Nile, Warab and Northern Bargazal grows increasingly more difficult. In our next story, and ahead of the International Day of Mine Awareness, which is marked every year on April 4th, we shed some light on what the work of hundreds of deminers across South Sudan looks like through the eyes of Kairu Nemoto. Meet Kairu Nemoto from Japan. She is the director of the United Nations Information Center in Tokyo. Nemoto traveled to South Sudan for about a week to see for herself and write stories about the work of the UN Mine Action Service, which has been involved in demining vast areas in South Sudan. Her visit will hopefully also showcase UN and agency efforts to relevant stakeholders in Japan. More specifically, it will shine a light on how these efforts are contributing to peace and security in the country. I have seen how uh, uh, mine action, mine clearance can help uh, as enabler for humanitarian activities and also uh, to help uh, people uh, of South Sudan to get on their feet in livelihood. Her timely visit came ahead of the International Day of Mine Awareness, giving her enough time to write about what she saw in South Sudan. While Nemoto was still in the country, an announcement came through that the people of Japan had contributed 2.3 million US dollars to a project deploying quick response teams in South Sudan with a specific task of conducting humanitarian mine action activities. Continued funding from the people of Japan will support quick response teams in conducting surveys and clearance of explosive hazards and providing risk education to enable people to stay safe and report explosive risk in their vicinity. Over the past four years, Japan's contribution to mine action operations in South Sudan has amounted to $12.5 million, and this has enabled the clearance of 3,972,675 square meters of land in areas including boreholes, food drop sites, allowing for the delivery of risk education to 54,358 civilians, most of them children. 
In South Sudan, 110,180,994 square meter of land is known to be contaminated and hundreds of new hazards are discovered every month. Nemoto also visited the Bentiu Fields office and said she was impressed by how the UN, humanitarian agencies, as well as UNIMIS were working as one, trying to stabilize the situation that would gradually have the people to go back to normal lives. Every week we end our program with various voices of peace. This week, we share with you voices of peace from the arrival of the SPLM in opposition. Be sure to join us next week for more updates. Let the people of South Sudan uh, know that uh, peace now is uh, being implemented and uh, I agree with the minister that uh, it's very soon we shall form the government of national unity. This is the actual beginning of the implementation of the agreement. And this is the actual implementation of chapter two of the transitional security arrangements and the permanent ceasefire. They are most welcome in their capital and we are happy to receive them.